In this age of reboots and sequels and prequels and spin-offs, is there room for one more? Lionsgate certainly thinks so, with their upcoming prequel, The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, based on the fourth book of the series, published in 2020 and boasting, by far, the longest title to date. But what does the audience think? Is this the triumphant return of everyone's favorite book series about children fighting to the death for the enjoyment of people watching at home? No, not, not that one. Get out of here. Or will it be seen as simply milking the IP for every last drop of cash? Rebooting the franchise seems like a no-brainer considering the loyal fan base and the financial success of the first four films. It has worked wondrous for other franchises in regenerating interest in the original films as well as opening up a new revenue stream. Mmm, revenue streams. The release of Fantastic Beasts saw a 64% increase in searches for the Harry Potter films, and The Rings of Power led to a 124% increase in searches for the Lord of the Rings trilogy in the week following its release. This all seems very promising for Ballad, especially considering the Hunger Games saga's past glory with its impressive haul of just under $3 billion at the global box office. Industry reports that Ballad is expected to gross $50 million on opening weekend. Sounds like a lot of money. And it is. But Mockingjay Part 2, which had the worst opening weekend of the franchise, still managed more than double that with $102 million. And this is just a continuation of a negative trend. So why is that? What might be causing this downward trajectory in one of cinema's most successful franchises? Well, according to numerous articles written on this subject, a big reason for the declining performance of the Hungry Hungry Games, and indeed the whole young adult dystopia genre, was audience fatigue, a phrase that most of us have probably heard thrown around to account for the diminishing box office returns from recent MCU projects. Look, audiences can only stomach so many films that are roughly about the same things before they stop bothering to go see them. Adaptations of dystopian YA books were very popular in the early 2010s, with franchises like Maze Runner and Divergent quickly following the first Hunger Games film. And they didn't stop coming to theaters after that, even though audiences kind of did. With this kind of saturation often aiming to get money from people waiting for the next installment in their favorite franchise, the quality tends to tank, and the films end up tropey and one-dimensional. The Hunger Games films were the gold standard, and arguably launched the wave of adaptations, so is a strong contender to produce another solid entry in the genre. Despite many probably not thinking about The Hunger Games at all since the late 2010s, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes sold half a million copies in its first week, and that was during the pandemic, when bookstores were largely closed. We will see how those book sales translate into ticket sales, considering the core fans were in their teens in the 2010s, so our late 20s to early 30s now. This is when we start to see a drop off in cinema visits as money gets diverted to pesky annoyances like rent and bills and raising children. So what is this film about? The story takes place 64 years before the events of the originals and tells the origins of Coriolanus Snow, the eventual president of Pan Am. While we know Snow as portrayed by the inimitable Donald Sutherland, his younger self will be played by Tom Blythe. The straight villain origin story has proved very popular recently with Joker winning two Oscars. Movies like Deadpool and Venom and Suicide Squad take villains and force them into heroic roles, often for great comedic effect and box office returns. But why focus on Snow? He was not a fan favorite by any means. In fact, when polled, he ranked 16th, whereas the third place favorite, Haymitch, seemed like the obvious choice for a follow-up. Well, as beloved as characters become, the real trick to capturing an audience for the long run is to get them invested in the world. We know what Pan Am has grown into by the time Katniss volunteers herself as tribute, but this film will explain some of how it came to be that way. We will learn about how the game started in the first place, and how they evolved from a concept into the sponsorship-heavy, televised spectacle that we know. This emphasis on fleshing out the world received great audience response in the cases of Fantastic Beasts and The Rings of Power, and paves the way for future projects that don't rely on familiar protagonists. As for Snow, while this is a villain origin story, it is also a coming-of-age story. The 18-year-old must wrestle with his instincts for both good and evil, which I think we can all relate to, albeit in hopefully lower-stakes circumstances. So what else about the film has the comment sections all a Twitter? Ballad will also feature a return of the actual games, although in proto-form, which were absent from Mockingjay. Honestly, do we think anyone would go see a fresh Hunger Games movie that didn't involve a deathmatch between children? <laughs> of course not. At the helm of the project is Francis Lawrence, no relation to Jennifer, who directed the last three Hunger Games films. Cinematographer Joe Willems shot the same three, and the script was partly written by Lawrence's longtime collaborator and writer of Catching Fire, Michael Arndt. Familiar faces go a long way in soothing existing fans' worries in a reboot situation, and the team behind the camera is just as important as in front of it. This trio did a good job in retaining what made the book so beloved, and judging by the comments on the trailer, looks like they've done it again. Music is also a key part of the film, with Olivia Rodrigo providing an original song for the soundtrack, tapping into yet another fan base, and crucially the under 30s, who actually still go to the movies. Grammy winning producer Dave Cobb also wrote music to support the lyrics written by Suzanne Collins. Cobb is extremely successful in the country music scene, and his expertise perfectly fits with the Appalachian folk vibe of the music written for the impoverished District 12. The music became a staple feature of the original films, with famous artists contributing tracks to all four of them, and Ballad looks set to do the same with the official soundtrack to be released on the same day as the film. Some of you will remember Katniss singing The Hanging Tree in Mockingjay Part 1. This song not only gets a reprise, can it be a reprise if it's in the past? 
But anyway, but it is actually written by Snow's love interest, Lucy Gray Bayer, during the film, after she witnesses the events described in the lyrics. The world of spin-offs and reboots is full of little details like this, where an iconic motif is explained, adding to the richness of the lore. So what about the cast? Well, we mentioned Tom Blythe will play Coriolanus Snow. He has a background in adventure projects, his most notable role being in MGM's original Western series, Billy the Kid. He's trading the rough and tumble Wild West for sci-fi dystopia and has an all-star supporting cast around him, in Jason Schwartzman, Viola Davis, and Peter Dinklage, to name a few. Davis is a recurring piece of the DC universe, and Dinklage made it all the way to season 8 of Game of Thrones. Both of those fan bases overlap with that of The Hunger Games, so their appearances should be a big draw and bolster box office numbers. Davis, in particular, will add an appealing element for the parents chaperoning their teens who haven't gotten their driver's licenses yet. Her Oscar-winning performance in Fences and her celebrated role in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom have earned her fans in a slightly older demographic. On the other end of the spectrum, Hunter Schaefer made waves with her portrayal of Jules on the HBO series Euphoria, and, aside from being a talented actor, has done wonders for the inclusion and portrayal of transgender people on screen. Inclusivity and visibility are especially important to the younger demographics the ballad will rely on for box office success. She will play Snow's cousin Tigress, who we know from the original films as well. A very strong cast to be sure, but there is one major question mark that could have a significant impact on the film's box office performance. Rachel Zegler plays Lucy Gray Baird, the tribute from District 12 and Snow's mentee. Zegler is the star of Disney's live-action remake of Snow White. She's received a lot of negative press following some disparaging comments she made about the original character of Snow White, and the prince, and the film in general, and the Disney World ride, and love? Fans of Disney were already slightly confused by the casting of Zegler, a Hispanic woman, as Snow White, but that's par for the course for Disney's live-action remakes. However, any uneasiness surrounding the casting choice was amplified by Zegler's apparent disdain for the original film's message, and many are threatening to boycott. It is hard to find much support at all for Zegler's comments, and the direction of the new Snow White. Ooh, insert joke here about Coriolana Snow and Snow White. Much of the backlash is not simply about her dismissive attitude to true love as a goal for young women. Many commenters support the idea of a film about a young woman growing into the leader she knows she can be. They just object to repurposing a classic love story to do so. It is part of a larger backlash against heavy-handed woke messaging, where the film becomes just a vehicle for an opinion, without the decency to even disguise it as a clever allegory. The Hunger Games franchise actually seems like the perfect place for Zegler, given that diversity and female leaders were core themes of the original films, and there was no suggestion that true love would fix everything. The fact of the matter is that Zegler, despite her first two feature credits being in Spielberg's West Side Story and Shazam! Fury of the Gods, has never been in a film that's actually made money. Of course, that's not directly her fault, and it should be of some comfort to the studio that in all the press she has done ahead of this film, release, she's had nothing but glowing things to say about the original four and her experience on Ballad. However, it can take a long time to shed a bad reputation, especially in Hollywood, and Lionsgate may still be worried about the impact she could have on audience turnout. Zegler was also supposed to appear in Paddington 3, but backed out, citing the SAG after strike as the reason. Some speculate the decision was more motivated by her plummeting stock, and the strikes provided a graceful way for her and the production to part ways. Speaking of strikes, I know what you're thinking. How can Ballad be going ahead in the midst of these negotiations? Well, the film has secured an interim agreement that allows the stars to promote the film. We will see if this leads to a focused campaign on social media and late night talk shows, which could significantly increase the opening weekend box office projections. I'm sure the film's press team would be delighted to have the stars appear on Kimmel or Fallon, boosting excitement and interest in the new movie with their charming personalities and pre-approved, heavily scripted wit. While there are no clear figures indicating the budget, the original films range from $80 million to $160 million. Ballad is less action focused, so we can speculate that the budget will be in the lower part of that range. Provided that's the case, there's no reason to think the film can't make money, especially considering the success of the Netflix rewatch campaign, which saw all four original films available to stream from March 2023. This led to three times as much Hunger Games content hitting TikTok in March versus February of this year, amassing 17 million engagements on the platform alone. Deadline reported that the series also saw a 425% uptick in followers on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. With huge intrigue being generated so quickly, it was crucial to capitalize on this momentum, and there was no question of delaying the releases, as so many other films have done in the face of the strikes. But enough about what we think. We want to know what you think. Head over to Popcorn to have your voice heard by the studios who actually make these crazy things. Oh, and if you want more analysis like this, check out our last video, linked on screen. Click me.